Thank you. Start there. Um, yeah, so we're actually going to start. Before I even say who I am, we're going to start with the true story. A quote, as best as I can remember this, um, from one of our senior developers, and yours truly. Um, and I'd asked him a whole bunch of questions about, about how to build stuff in Drupal. He goes, Well, I mean, if you're going to build this, you're going to need to call you know, this class, and you're going to call this service, and you're going to need, and I have no idea what he's talking about. And I say, How did you learn that like the first time? Like, how could I have possibly figured this out myself? Um, and he, he sort of stares off in his space for a while and says, well, I, I, I saw it in a module somewhere. Um, which was so disappointing, because I was really hoping he was going to tell me about some great plugin for VS Code or something. But uh, he saw it in a module somewhere. So uh, we're going to see something in a module somewhere today. Uh, I have this, you know, kind of half about imposter syndrome. I built this whole massive thing. I know what I was doing. It's, it's been on and on for a few years now. And so, you know, this is kind of a what I learned. Um, ramble, let's say. It's a tour. Uh, so I'm John Jameson. I'm at Princeton University. Uh, I'm an access a digital accessibility developer, which is one of these weird hybrid positions that universities like to have, which I love. Um, so I do accessibility testing. I do remediation. I do front-end development. Um, and I do like end user, um, like mentoring and training for other developers at Princeton. Uh, and this stuff. So uh, the slides, if you want them, uh, editorially spelled with an 11 because accessibility. Uh, Editorially.princeton.edu slash GC23 has the slides. Um, or if you just get to the home page, it's like under news. Uh, so we'll go from there. Um, so, Weirdly, I'm not actually talking about editorial today. Uh, I have another talk tomorrow, I'm going to do that. Uh, but just so you have at least some context, this is an accessibility checker, it's an automatic accessibility checker. It runs on the front end, sort of embeds into the theme. When an editor is viewing a page or previewing a page, um, it automatically pops up if it detects something uh, and, and you know, announces that it found something and highlights it with a little tool tip. Uh, and if you open the tool tip, it's going to give a um, as plain as I've been able to write it so far, uh, description of what's wrong uh, and how to fix it uh, from a content editor's sort of needs perspective. It's not going to mention the word WCAG. Uh, if you don't know what it is, I'm not going to tell you. That's the point. Like This is just for the editors to, to try to clean out what they're creating. Um, and it has some extra buttons, so they can, they can hide it for themselves, or if you've given them enough permissions, they can actually mark this as checked and okay for everyone, so it won't alert on this. Um, Again, uh, that kind of thing. Uh, and then it, it phones home with anything it detects. So there's, you've got site reports where you can explore and see you know, which, which errors have been found where and um, all that sort of thing. And we're done talking about the module. OK, so say you want to build something. Um, uh, my sort of first thing when I was rebuilding this for, for version 2 that, that I had to run to was, was how do I actually rewrite these tests? in vanilla JavaScript, because um, I had been doing everything in jQuery up until then, because, hey, how many of us are self-taught developers? A lot of us. Um, jQuery, jQuery has been so popular for all these years because it's very readable. Um, it's very forgiving. If you want to go rooting around in the HTML and find some, you know, maybe possible mistake someone's created, you can just say, you know, dollar sign or jQuery or whatever, you know, go get me some CSS selector. And then, you know, whatever you find in there, go find inside that for another CSS selector. And hey, go get the first one and get me the text of that. And it'll come back and say, oh, you know, I'm a heading. Um, it's very quick to learn. Um, a lot of people are trying to get off it. It's a big library. When it was written, a lot of this was really quite painful to do in JavaScript. JavaScript has gone through so many versions since then that, that it isn't as needed anymore. And so I was starting to get bug reports on Drupal that people were pulling the jQuery dependencies out of their site, and they were annoyed that my module was making them put it back in. So that's one of the reasons this began. Um, vanilla JavaScript is so much less forgiving than jQuery. When you first start rewriting things, um, you know, you look at this and you say, OK, so there's this thing called get element by ID, because I was looking for an ID. So I'll say, you know, ID, pound main, query selector. That takes any sort of 
uh, CSS thing, H2, getting the text content, and you get an uncaught type error, error, and all execution stops, and your JavaScript explodes, and your computer goes home. Um, because there was a typo, because I didn't need the, the pound sign in main, uh, so it didn't actually return any elements, and so when I tried to do a query selector inside the array of elements, there were no elements, so it said, oh, that's null, that's not an array, I don't know how to run this on something that isn't an array, so I'm just gonna break all JavaScript on the page for you. You're welcome. Um, yeah. So, I've been in these tabs for months. Um, you might not need jQuery, it's such a very well-named site. Uh, that's also the URL. Uh, it, if, you, if I could scroll down on the screen, it's two columns, and one column is, here's what you learned in jQuery, how to do it, and the right column is, uh, here's a way you could accomplish the same thing in JavaScript. There's certainly more than one. Um, but it's, it's a good place to start. And then the Mozilla Developer Network Web Docs, MDN, if you've never been there, they're really thorough and have good examples and, and, and are very friendly. And so, you know, I kept these up for a long time. So, what did I learn? Um, query selector all in JavaScript, very similar to the dollar sign in, in jQuery. This just says, you know, return me a list of all of the, the things that match this. Um, but what I found is by the time I was rewriting this, CSS had done some new cool things. So CSS now has these selectors, like is uh, and not, where you can you can actually give like chain lists of things in the CSS selectors. We can say like is h1, h2, h3, h4, and not you know an h2 in nav or an h3 in footer. Uh, and then the JavaScript hands that to the browser, and the browser manufacturers have spent a lot of time optimizing their CSS layer um, so the CSS is fast. And so it just comes right back to you um, very performantly, rather than trying to do all kinds of uh, filters and back and forths and eaches and things that I used to do. Um, so that's great. So that was fun to learn. Um, chaining in you know, jQuery, like that first example, you know, you can say this, dot, that, dot, that, dot, that. You know, JavaScript, I mean, that is jQuery is just JavaScript. So. Um, but there's, you know, the syntax is different. So you can do query selector to go down, you can do closest to go up. You know, like I mean, the, the, that matches myself or any ancestor. It takes the first one and it hits. You can say next element sibling, previous element sibling. So you can kind of work your way around the DOM just like you're used to. Um, but then there's this thing called optional chain. And I don't do this on the front end yet because old browsers will blow up if you do this, but at the Drupal back end, we can expect people to have <coughs> updated their browser in the last five years. Um, optional chaining, you do question mark dot instead of dot. And so it, it's, it's a circuit breaker. So if I do query selector um, and try to go down into something and it doesn't return anything, and then I do you know, dot closest to try to go back up, rather than stopping all execution of JavaScript on the page and breaking the page, um, it's going to just return undefined as if I had put a whole long if statement around each of these steps saying, you know, if this, do this, if not, return undefined, if this, do that. Um, so that's very useful. Um, so I do a lot of that editorially. You can still cause problems down in your next step in your thing because now you have a string and that can be surprising. But regardless, you know, learning this was a big first step. Um, and then we can start to do stuff. So, you know, here's an example. So one of the tests that, um, that I have, um, uh, I'm always pausing here because Adam Chabrick up at Toronto Metropolitan University wrote Sally, and we're always passing tests back and forth, so I trail off sometimes, but I don't remember who wrote any of these tests. <laughs> so, <clears throat> not going to take credit for this. One of us wrote this. Um, so, one of the things we do is we look for a, a whole line of text that's bold on the page. So, if someone has a paragraph that's just like half a sentence and no punctuation, and it's all bold, more often than not, that should have been a head. So, this is one of our tests. Um, so what do I do? I have, I've gotten a list of paragraphs on the page. I do, I, I'm now doing a for each through them, and I say, you know, within the paragraph, check if there's a strong, because I have a bunch of other tests I'm going to run to. Um, and then I'm going to go back and get the text. I'm going to start looking at the text. Um, so I'm going to get the text. So, if you're like me, and you were self-taught, you, you know, used to work with HTML. Um, in JavaScript, you can say .html, and you can get or set the HTML of an element and examine it. Uh, stop doing that. <laughs> That's you know, one of the things you learn quickly. You know, with the OWASP, um, it just it's, it's fraught with um, 
vulnerabilities. And I'll, I'll explain that later. Um, but there's two things when you start reading documentation. There's two competing ways in JavaScript to get the text. One's called inner text, one's called text content. Um, and the difference between them is the inner text is rendered. So if you have, say, three spans in your link, and like there's the text, and then maybe there's an external link icon, and then maybe there's a span that's like visually hidden that says external link or something like that. Um, and maybe there's something like display none, like there's something in there you have in there that JavaScript is hidden or whatever. This is going to take the text after all your CSS has done its stuff um, and return that. So if something is display none, it won't be there. Um, so this is processed. This is actually the text node. Um, and so if, if I'm just looking at CK Editor and saying, you know, has someone made all this bold? That's what I want. So I'm going to say, get me the text content, um, the actual physical characters that have been put into this thingy I'm looking at. Um, and then I write an if statement. So I say, okay, we got the text of this. Um, so let's let's do let's get we get the text of that. I'm gonna get the length of it, how many characters it is. So I can say, you know, get get the dot length. Um, uh, and I'm gonna do this dot match thing that, that with a well, this, this is a regular expression. So I'm saying, you know, look inside it for a period or a colon or a semicolon. Um, See if there's any of those. Uh, and then I'm just going to say, you know, if, if the length is between these two completely arbitrary numbers that I made up, uh, you know, 5 and 121 characters, uh, I'm going to think that's awfully suspicious. That's about the length of a heading often. Um, and if the number of characters in the bold part of the sentence um, is the same as the number of characters in the whole sentence, now I know that the whole thing was bold. Like I said, there's more than one way to do the same thing with anything. But this was the thing I figured out worked well, you know, just see if, you know, because if I, just a couple words are bold in the paragraph, that's not the whole paragraph. Um, and rather than doing some really complicated thing of trying to count nodes and iterating and things, you know, this is just like, okay, are all the characters bold? Yeah. Um, then uh, maybe, uh, and then if it doesn't have a period, you know, then okay, that's really suspicious. And so now I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to log that as, you know, that, that could be a problem. Um, here's another example of a test. Uh, so like meaningless links. Uh, you love a page where you get it on a page and there's like 53 links that are all clicked here. Um, I discourage that. Uh, but one of the things when you start looking into this and you say, oh, gee, I wish I could just tell people not to do that, is that you, know, you hire people to write things because they're creative writers. Um, they're also creative with their issues. So it could be click here, it could be here, it could be more, learn more. This, this page, uh, you know, learn more on this page. Click here to learn more on this page. There's like an infinite number of permutations here of meaningless links um, that I found. So if you want to try and make a list of those, it's going to, it's going to hurt you. So uh, after thinking about this for a long time, what I came up with was uh, a regular expression. And so I say, here's a list of words that are meaningless. Um, and I want you to get the, we're going to get text content, get the text of the link. Um, and delete all these words uh, and you know, any spaces and punctuation um, and see if there's anything left. And if the remaining length is zero, then I know that this is some I mean, this I don't know if it was this sentence, but there, there was, I have some screenshot of the longest link this has ever caught in the wild. And it was something like click here to learn more. Um, uh, you know, then I can flag that. Whereas meaningful links, it's going to knock out the links, but it's going to keep the meaningful, and that doesn't get flagged. So. Um, so you know, you be creative. You know, this is not. Uh, I, I like to show these kind of things because when I first started on this, I kind of everything was a black box. People talk about axe, the con you know, that it was checker and then wave, and it, and it sort of seemed scary and powerful. And it, it was very liberating to learn that it's just if statements under the hood. Um, so, um, and then push. So push is the way you throw something into an array. So I have this basket of results I found basically, and I'm going to push um, some information into that array now. So uh, that's going to include something. I have this dismissal key. It's, it's another function. Basically, it just takes some something that I have in here, and this is probably the text for this one, but, but something that's somewhat unique. It's an identifier. So if someone wants to ignore this, this is how I recognize that that's what it, that it shouldn't be flagged again. Um, and so I'm going to push like this element and which test was the problem and and uh, what the title should be of that. And I'm going to put all this in a basket of results. Um, and this was something from Sally V1. You know, this was the change. This was, this was part of this rewrite, and now it's in Sally V2 has this, editorially has this now, where we're doing this whole array thing because um, it does all kinds of magic. So a lot of these checkers, 
um, in the wild where we've got these rewrites, they would find an error, and they would flag the error, and then they find the next error, and they flag the error. Well, if you do that, um, you, there's so much magic you can't do. So if you build the basket first, you know, you can do things like modify the array before you flag things. So I can, after I've done all the checks, I can go get my list of dismissed and ignored things and knock them out of the array first. Um, or I can send a copy of the array up to the server for the reports. Um, or I can swap out the entire front end. Um, so I can do headless, I can do headless checking, I can, I can have a whole different interface. Um, but also for performance. So in the JavaScript world, when you are trying to read what's on the page, it has to be on the page to read it. So um, the browser has to paint elements. And some of these checks, if you're assigning to check an element's visible, let's say, you know, one of the things you're checking is does it have height and width? Um, well, if you write to an element on a page, the document sort of makes a mental note that its, it's, it's painted version of the page is now stale, which is fine, unless someone tries to read the page again. If you try to read the page again, the browser's going to say, hang on JavaScript, i got to repaint. I'm just going to repaint the page, and then it'll read it. And then you say, OK, let's write to it again. And the browser's like, all right. Um, and so if I'm going to check every component on the page with like 40 different checks, that thrashing can be like a 10 to 100 fold slowdown. Um, but if I do all the reads once, there's zero paints. And then I can do all the writes once, um, and there's one paint. So performance. Um, and that really matters. So something like uh, Axe, the Axe plugins and accessibility checker, um, you know, if you have a decent sized page and you tell it to check the page, what you're going to find is the whole page freezes up for about a second. You're not going to notice that because you just clicked a button on a checker. And you're expecting it to do something. And so this feels powerful. You know, I could see them even just putting a like, deliberate delay in there because it feels really cool and something has to stop and think. It doesn't matter. But I'm going to run on every page loop. If you're editing your site in Drupal, and every time you navigate to a page in Drupal, the whole page freezes up for a second, you're going to uninstall my module. Um, so after all these optimizations, you know, it's, it's like under 100 milliseconds for a run. Um, so that matters if you're going to start developing this front stuff. Do your performance testing. Um, you're, you're, you're checking and things like that. Um, the other reason this matters is because uh, async is a lie. Um, when I started learning JavaScript, I saw that there were there were asynchronous functions. So you could say async, and I was like, oh, I'll just make my, all of my functions async because you know I, I want to run multi-threaded. Um, no, JavaScript is single-threaded. Um, that whole like paint, read, write, read, write, that all has to happen in order. So there are ways to create a second thread that are really complicated. I haven't learned yet, um, but functionally, if you're writing JavaScript, it's all sharing one thread, and it's a line. Everything waits in line. And so if you hit a page and like you click on the menu and the menu doesn't open, um, or it like opens a second later, it's because there was a really long line of things running in the background and your click had to sit at the end of the line and couldn't actually fire until the line cleared. Um, so it, it matters. And async, async doesn't mean execute asynchronously. It means um, I am going to set a callback. So like it, it was designed to be like if you're doing a call out to like the JSON API to the server. Async means go make the call and then get out of line and let other people do things. And then once I hear back from the server, you know, here's my new JSON or whatever, now get back in line and execute. But the actual function executes synchronously. Um, so all of those asyncs that I spent time rewriting did nothing. Um, so what I ended up doing was a um, really old fashioned thing. And uh, each of my tests, takes a while. I mean, maybe 10, 20 milliseconds, something like that. Not a lot, but all of them in a row, that's a big chunk. But if I put a timeout between each test, a zero second timeout, um, the thing about a timeout is it means it steps out of line, and the timeout is like a click. It can't fire while there's still a line. And so everything that was waiting in line, like a user click, you know, this timeout says, OK, call me in zero milliseconds. But that's zero milliseconds after the line clears, not from now. And so that user click goes immediately, and then my test, next test resumes. So the user doesn't know editorially is running, because I'm never consuming the main thread for more than like 10 milliseconds at a time. So I didn't know that, and that's the point. It's OK to not know things. Um, we all learn sometimes. So OK, so I said many slides ago, you should stop <laughs> saying HTML. So if I look at 
my old code and many people's JavaScript code. You know, if you want to put a paragraph on the page, they say, you know, you know this element .html is, and then there's some HTML that they've written. And the JavaScript goes, okay, slams it into the page. Well, if that HTML comes from user input, and it's something like close bracket, open bracket, script, cross-site scripting attack, um, and you're using HTML, it's going to get written right in there. Um, and it might execute. Uh, so the right way to do this, which is very verbose, is you say, you know, let my whatever equal document dot create element, whatever, p div h2, you create an element, and then you add properties to that element. You say, I want its text content to be this horrible cross-site scripting attack, and I want its, uh, it have a class list, a list of classes, Add to the list of classes this horrible cross-site scripting attack. Um, but because I'm doing it this way, these are like, I don't remember, I'm not computer science, uh, functionally like typed information. So the browser is only going to stick properties into that class that it knows they're actually valid classes. It's going to do the sanitization or whatever it needs uh, to make sure that that's not going to do something. Uh, and the text content is going in as a text node. So even if that is like physically a terrible attack, it's going to be the text of the attack as if you had like a source block on your page that was like HTML. It's not executable because it's not a real node, it's text. New habits. Learn them. Um, all right, but see, I stick it in the page. Now I have a paragraph. Great. Um, well, now it inherits the site CSS. I'm making a widget. It's being drawn on someone else's site because it's a Drupal module. There are infinite themes out there. Um, so. Uh, this little game of whack-a-mole here in this picture, you know, you need like the little holes and pack up, pack up, hop up, and you have to try to whack them with the pedal. It was whack-a-mole. So, so um, version one was full of all of these uh, exclamation point importance. You know, well, this this should be this padding and display block, and I had like global presets. Um, and exclamation important is bad in the accessibility world uh, because if someone has like user styles, like say they're overriding the fonts or the font sizes, you know, you're going to be Cross overriding that, and, and plus it's gross, and it was a game of whack a mole. I keep getting bugs when it finds like some some new theme that uh, my widgets are broken on. So I learned about web components. I I would go into many of these camps and conferences, and people were talking about web components. And I sat there kind of smiling and pretending I knew what they were talking about. I finally read the documentation. So a web component, it's custom tag generally. Um, so you know you can just name it like Jim. You know whatever it is it doesn't have to be did. You, know, you can make any tag you want. Um, mine is called Edly Element Tip. Um, and then it has this thing called a shadow root. Um, and that's not a real node. That's, this is a browser thing. It's like an iframe. Um, things on this side of the shadow root, um, by default, are not inheriting things from outside the shadow root. It's porous, unlike an iframe. Like You can send things across it. But if I stick this on someone else's theme, it is not going to inherit anything in their theme by default. Magically. I was very excited to learn this. Um, so how do you do it? So it's all boilerplate. So and this, this is all. It copied straight off MDM, uh, the, Mozilla, the Mozilla Developer Network. Um, so it's all kinds of boilerplate. So you say, like, class, you know, whatever you want my name to be, extends HTML elements, which means use the boilerplate for this is a chunk of HTML. And then you write, it's just boilerplate. I didn't write this. Constructor super, that means essentially this is saying, this is a div at the moment. Inherit everything you know about divs and just pretend that this new tag is a div. Um, and then you write, you know, custom elements. Hey, browser, a list of custom elements. Define every element tip or div2 or migrate div um, as one of these classes. Um, boilerplate, you don't have to understand it. Copy and paste it. Uh, and then that does, it creates um, a connected callback. This is part of the, 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 the boilerplate. So when you insert one of these things on your page, that means it's now connected to the DOM. So it's now stuck into the DOM. And so the browser goes looking in, in this custom class for connected callback. Uh, and then you do whatever you want. It's just a function. But it will be automatically called when the tag is created. So I'm doing things like, you know, when you're, when you're creating this, um, go look at yourself. You know, this Edly element tag is going to have 
attributes, and it's going to have one. You know, one of the attributes is going to be which result it's for, um, that kind of thing. And so I, I can kind of look at it and then do just whatever JavaScript I want. Um, and I can say attach shadow. So that that means you know attach this thing as shadow DOM, not normal DOM. And I go from there. Um, you can attach CSS. So CSS in the in the JavaScript world is just text. Um, it's a it's a tag of type style. So you just create an element of style and you write text content and now you're just you're just writing CSS in your JavaScript. Um, and the rest is just HTML. So I'm just like over and over again creating elements and giving them classes and things like that. And so you have that magical shadow root, um, but except for that thing which is new, everything else here is just the normal HTML you're used to. But not only does it break inheritance, it also sets up automatic communication methods. So um, if the attributes on it change, um, the browser automatically creates an observer for changes. And so it's also looking in that class for something called observed attributes, in which you can say, hey browser, tell me if the data edly action attribute changes, because I'm, I'm going to care if that changes. Um, and then you can write whatever you want. So this attribute change callback, boilerplate attribute, old value, new value, I didn't write that, that's boilerplate, um, you know, says if, if the new value is open, uh, we're going to we're going to toggle the tip. Um, this is mostly boilerplate. But what that means now is the browser handles all my communication. So I have all of these classes all over the place. I have all these instances all over the place. I'm not a good enough developer to know how to make them talk to each other. The browser does for me. So I have this, this panel that's popped open. I have a next button that's, gonna, that's supposed to open the next tip on the page. But this is a shadow component and whatever. So is that. They don't know about each other. Um, so that next button calls a function from my global. I have this global edly instance, and it has a function called next. And that next, um, it knows which result is open, uh, and it just goes and gets the next number in line, and it changes its data attribute to open, um, which triggers that callback. And so that particular instance of my tag uh, says, oh, I'm supposed to open? Okay. And it opens. And it's all just magic. I don't have to do any of it. It's cool. Okay. Let's learn some JavaScript, hopefully. Um, <laughs> uh, it's a tour. It's not a training. I don't expect you to do it after this, but you've seen it in the module somewhere. You know where to look. So you want to send results to Drupal. So I've now, I've now run my scam. I have a bunch of results. Um, I want to send them to Drupal. Uh, so this is the next thing I had to learn. I don't know how to send something to Drupal. So I had to learn about routes uh, and controllers and databasey stuff. So if you've been sitting in all of these camps and cons and pretending you know what people are talking about, here's what's inside a Drupal line. Um, you'll see a bunch of files that end in YAML. Um, these are text files. These are pretty much human readable. They have very specific names that Drupal's expecting. Um, and, and they do things. I'll show you in a moment. But they're, they're, they're configuration, basically. Um, so you can look at those and read and what they do. There's also some, some dot module, dot install funny files that don't have an extension. Those are PHP, but they're specifically named things that Drupal is looking for in a module. Um, and the name matters, and we'll look at those. Um, and then there's just custom files, from PHP, JavaScript, whatever you want. But these, these little name matters one, I had to learn what each of these did one at a time. Um, if you want to learn this, uh, there are examples. Drupal.org has docs, and there's the, the Drupal APIs doc and a developed doc. Uh, you might get lucky uh, and find what you're looking for. Um, but otherwise, find someone who's seen it in a module somewhere. Um, yeah, you know, this is something I had to learn. Because I kept thinking that there was this magic under the hood, that if I found the right plugin for VS Code or whatever, it would tell me how to do something. And there just wasn't any magic. And I just had to learn to you know, go, go on Slack ask my peers if anyone knew of any modules or core functions that did something similar to what I wanted to do. And then I could go read their code. And I, it seems like most people out there, that's how they're learning. If you know a better way, please tell me and I'll rewrite this talk. So I wanted to sync these things. I wanted to give mark okay for all users. I want to send that up. I want to send a list of issues detected up. So um, boilerplate. Drupal has boilerplate documented on Drupal.org for how you send data to Drupal through the JSON API. 
And it looks like this. I've changed like one line from this. So I have, you know, I have I want to post data. Um, so it has this whole CSRF token thing that's a cross-site request forgery token. Um, so having one of those in hand lets Drupal verify that the person who's about to send a data is a logged in user on the right page to be trying to send data. I don't do anything. This is boilerplate. Drupal's already spun all this up. Um, so I'm just copy pasting that in. Um, and so it gets a current token. Um, and it gets the, the API URL, which I need to know. Uh, and then it's just going to send JSON. So you know, the body of my message is JSON stringify data. And data is going to be an array of data. So the only thing I've changed here is whatever the URL of my API is, and then data. And there's going to be a whole bunch of functions. This is what actually data I want to shove into this pile. Um, but that's boilerplate. But you got to send it to someone. So you need to have the other parts of this module built. I need permissions. I need to know who. Who is allowed to send data to Drupal? I need to know where it can be sent, what URL um, is going to handle this. Um, I need to know what data is allowed to be sent and process that. Um, and I need to know how to store it. Uh, who, where, what, how. Uh, so one at a time. So I said YAML are sort of human readable text. So editorially.permissions.yaml looks like this, and it goes on and on. But each, each chunk is a machine name for a permission that I would like Drupal to make available on that list of permissions that you can give to users. Uh, and a human readable nice name for that. And like a nice little help text for that. And, and nothing. Nothing else. That's it. I have custom permissions. Um, that's why these YAML files are cool. Um, I don't need to know what Drupal's doing with these. I'm just handing Drupal a list of machine names and saying, hey, please take care of this for me. And it does. Uh, <clears throat> Routing.yaml, same thing for custom URLs. Each chunk is a machine name. So I'm going to create, I'm going to create API report, whatever, I made that. Um, and I say what path I would like. You know, like, this is just some URL I've made up. Um, and then I, I copy and paste this boilerplate, you know, where I have the controller. This is some function in my module in the controller folder that's named API controller. Um, this is just this is just the path to a function in my module that Drupal should tell if someone tries to send something here. So Drupal will grab the thing they tried to send, that body, and hand it to this function and say, here, you deal with this. That's what the controller is. Um, and there's some other goodies in there, like, hey, require this permission. I created that permission with the machine name of view editorially checker. Only people with that permission are allowed to send you stuff. Uh, so. That's a routing YAML file. Plain text. I don't have to know what's happening under the hood. They abstracted all this. Yay, Drupal 8, 9, 10. Um, what data is processed? So that, that controller has a little function that says, you know, grab that request and like unjsonify it, create a little good array, and send it off to this function. So this is now custom PHP. This is just a PHP file. Um, my backend developer helped me set this up. Hooray! Um, <coughs> yay. Uh, and so it has a function called you know, test results. Deal with the test results. And it's going to do things like there's another function in that file to say validate number. It's real complicated. It's like, is that an integer? Um, validate path. Is that a valid Drupal path? Um, so it's going to validate some of these. Because this is, this is an open place where I'm receiving data from the internet. So you know, I want to validate it a little bit. Um, but then it's going to look at each of the results in that array. So I have those results in the page. It's going to look at each of them. And it's going to shove them into the database. So this is boilerplate for sending something off to Drupal's database. You know, it's saying get get the get, get the Drupal connection to the database, and then do a thing: insert, update, merge. You know, there's a there's a Drupal page on the, the database API, and you, know, you stare at that for a long time. And so it's going to do things like insert a bunch of fields. So you know, you know, the page title for this database row should be you know, whatever was in that results bucket. And the page path should be whatever was in that bucket. Um, and I'm going to write this insert, you know, update, whatever, down the line, um, following that boilerplate. And it's going to send that over to the database. The database then is going to say, like, critical error, that table doesn't exist. That's not good. So <clears throat> the, this is, this is the, uh, the how. how. How is it supposed to be stored? So. Um, another specially named file is .install. 
you look in any module, there's going to be a dot install file, and this is Drupal calls this. Um, when you install it, well named, um, and it has things, you know, boilerplate things, like here's the database schema that I'm going to need. Uh, and it's another, this is a PHP array, where it's saying, you know, in the list of fields I'm going to need is an ID field, and I'm going to need a, you know, the, the, the type of text or, or like, integer or whatever. Uh, give me a big one. Um, uh, so this is just a list of the fields I need. Uh, and that schema is on that list of APIs. You know, you follow that syntax, uh, and you hand it that schema, and then Drupal has abstracted the rest of it. Drupal has the abstraction layer of how to actually convert that into a SQL request that calls up SQL and, and asks it to generate a table and, and, and do all these things. Um, so I, you know, you stick all that in there. Um, and then, you know, a few minutes, days, uh, weeks, <coughs> months possibly, I don't remember. <coughs> Gratitude to my boss for time. Um, one day, uh, this is the browser console where you can kind of see what it's up to. And it, it's, you know, it's trying to send this JSON with that pile of results. And it's trying to send it to uh, that URL, which was that API URL we created. And when it got there, it got handed off to the controller, and the controller handed it off to the test results function, and they sent something to the database, and nothing blew up. So Drupal responded with 200 OK. Um, does that mean it's in my database? No, not necessarily, but at least it means, like, you know, finally that was not a, like, 500 error crashing the server. Um, yay! And then I could look at one of these tools that lets you see what's in your database, and I could say, oh, look, there it says, link with no accessible test. Result name count five. Yay, it's in my database. I'm done. No, I'm not done because no one cares if it's in the database. They want to get it back. They want to see it. So you have to learn how to get stuff back. So, dot install, we have that schema. Dot module is where there's a whole bunch of specially named functions. These are called hooks. For people that want hooks. Uh, wrong slide. Okay, so, I forgot I said that. Drupal settings, Jason. Um, yes. Um, yes. When you get a page from Drupal, um, there is sent with each page a pile of JSON, if you're logged in, um, called Drupal settings, with a whole bunch of meta information. Um, modules can attach extra goodies to this. So if you have it totally installed, and you open up your console and inspect Drupal settings and go under Drupal settings dot editorially, You'll see there's a whole pile of stuff that I've attached to this. Um, things like, is this user allowed to mark something as OK? What is the API URL? Um, when was this page last changed? On from there. Um, there's a long list of things I'm sending. Uh, so in that dot module file, like I just said on the wrong slide, um, there's a specially named function, underscore page, underscore attachments, um, editorially page attachments. This is one of dozens of, of things Drupal exposes, where Drupal goes looking for these things at key moments. So at the moment that Drupal is building that Drupal settings attachment list, it goes and looks at every one of your installed modules. You know, it's cached this information. Let's, but let's pretend you just cleared cache. Um, it's going to look at every module and see if it has a dot module file, and see if it has a page attachments function. And if it does, it's going to run with whatever's in there. And so I can do things now, like I can say, you know, hey, it, hey, in the attachments, set a cache context of user permissions. If Drupal, um, if the current user has the permission, if it does not, ah, exclamation point, if the current user does not have permission to view editorially checker, go home. You're done. Don't do anything else. And cache that so that you, know, you can static cache. This is a public, this is a public page. The user is not logged in. Don't touch my module again. Save your brain. Um, if they are logged in and they have that permission, now I can do things like um, use the Drupal config API, which is my documentation. And I can say, hey, Drupal, go fetch from your config editorially settings um, and go get the settings for what part of the page editorially is allowed to check. I'm pulling that a content group. Um, and just stick it on the array. Attach Drupal settings dot editorially dot root equals you know, main or whatever. Uh, and, oh, and oh, and get that get a URL from a route, a named route. Go get the route named editorially API report, which was in that YAML file. So given that machine name, hey Drupal, 
generate the URL for that. Dump it out to a string and attach it to the pod. Um, and now I have that API URL, so I can send information. Uh, this, this function goes on and on and on and on and on. Uh, and it's horribly written. And feel free to contribute cleanup. Um, and you can attach libraries. So a library is a chunk of a, a collection of JavaScript and CSS. I have my own JavaScript and CSS, so I can say, hey, go attach the editorially library. It's going to attach the actual checker to the page. Um, and that's all that module. Um, so that'll get sent to the page, then the checker opens. Um, and then uh, we, pulled we pulled config in, but we got to make a page set of config, too. And we want to make a site report. So now we need to make custom pages, too. Uh, so, four of four, we're nearly done with your whirlwind. Uh, pages. So, config pages. Config pages are really complicated. Um, you, got, you, know, you might want to have a select, you got, you're going to get field sets, maybe collapsible field sets. Some things are going to be showing default values, some are going to be showing actual saved data. Um, just writing this out in HTML is going to take you a long time. Forget PHP. Uh, but Drupal, abstracted everything. So there's this thing called config form base out there. It's a Drupal class. It's in core. Um, and so you say, hey, my module settings extends config form base, which means, hey, Drupal, I would like you to make me a config page. Uh, and then you say public function build form. That's something that's in the config form base boilerplate. So my build form uh, is going to be for the editorially.settings configuration. Uh, and now I want you to build me um, four elements. And each of these things is going to be completely abstract. This is just like that JavaScript where I'm saying, like, create an element and then set its class and then set its text content. This works just like that. So I'm going to say, you know, in the content root section of my config page, uh, create a form element with the title of check content in these containers, uh, make it a text field. Uh, I don't need a placeholder. Uh, the description should be uh, the, the, that this T, if you've never seen it, means pass this to the translation layer. So someone could write a translation of my module now. So you know, whatever the current language version of, of you know, this, this nice text that explains what this thing is. Uh, and the default value for this should be uh, you, config form base. You know how to get configuration. Go get whatever that content root current value is. Maybe it's a default. Maybe it's something the user's picked. I don't know. Uh, you go get it, figure it out, stick it in there as the current value. Um, and now I've created a text field without an HTML. Does this look easier? No, that looks way harder. I pulled out my hair for weeks learning how to do this. Um, it's documented. Uh, there's this api.drupal.org slash api. You'll get to this if you just go to Drupal Help. You don't have to write this down. Uh, but Drupal Elements is all these form and render elements, and Drupal knows how to make 20 or 30 elements. Uh, and it's things like button or checkbox and things like that, and then you can take an array like that to create. Um, so you can you can do that and learn how to make an array. Here's when I learned to love this. I wrote this whole backend. I wrote this whole editorial in Drupal, um, and then I said, "Hey, let me port this to WordPress." And that little array that said, "Here, make me a text field," becomes this three columns of me crying in a WordPress. <laughs> Because it hasn't been abstracted. So I have to write my own function to figure out what the default value is. And I have to write the HTML out myself. And I have to create my own variables and shove them in their template. I have to validate the information myself. Because that Drupal get this thing from config and put it through the array, it's going to sanitize that for me. i got to sanitize it myself over here. Um, and so after I wrote the WordPress port, I said, now I love Drupal. And I didn't love Drupal until that day. <laughs> I love Drupal now. So render arrays are awesome once you get over the learning curve. Um, yeah. Uh, and I also, so editorially v1 and v2.0, um, I had a whole big uh, reports interface, a dashboard. Uh, and it was all made by hand with all those render arrays. Um, tons and tons and tons of coding. Um, I was very proud of it. It worked great. And then I got all these complaints uh, on Drupal.org from people because they wanted to use my data in their views, and they wanted to modify my dashboard, and I had hard-coded everything. And I was like, yeah, I don't know how to connect stuff to views. Um, so uh, Cryboob, I don't know how to pronounce this. If they happen to be in this room, say hello. Um, gave me a pull request, uh, which had all kinds of stuff like this. 
it had this, it had a, a, a views, um, a specially named file, that was called. If you look at my code, you'll find it. It's a specially named views data file uh, that has a specially named function called views data. And in here is, it's like a translation layer, where it's like, hey views, this module has a result, editor the results table. And inside that table is uh, fields. And these fields are, you can use those. Uh, and you can call them this, and maybe they can be filtered by this, and this is this type of information. Um, I hope this person had a script to create this, because it, it goes on and on and on. Yeah. He submitted, I love that the commit had 20 changed files with 1,700 deletions. I'm like, so much work. Um, <laughs> but it works. Um, and, and then the thing is, once you're exposed to views, uh, Drupal in the configuration development, there's a synchronize page in your config, um, and you can export uh, YAML files, text files. Uh, and so you can make a view, you can export that view into text, um, and it also comes with like a, a unique ID that you delete them. But, but this is just sitting in the module. So there's now a YAML file in the module that is Drupal's configuration of how to build that view for each of the views in the dashboard. Um, and then there's boilerplate, you know, uh, it, it says like if the Drupal, if Drupal, if, if views is enabled, uh, this is in my install file. So that .install file now has a part of the install process says, um, you know, if views exist, go get um, the path to the editorially config folder. Um, <laughs> And go get the that this complicated bit of boilerplate like means go get the file that's particular name. It's a YAML file and dump that into your configuration. <coughs> um, and so that boilerplate grabs these YAML files and creates all these views. Um, and so now my dashboard is built using views, and you can change it. Uh, and that's it. So that's it. Lots of work. <laughs> I don't expect anyone to be able to do this. The point of this is just you've seen it now. You know, you've seen it, and if one of those things is useful to you, you can go back and look at the, uh, uh, this one. So there's your whirlwind tour of how I had to learn how to build this thing. Um, you've seen it in a module somewhere now. Okay, so those slides are up there. Um, the module, the module, you know, you click source in the module, it's going to link to Drupal code uh, on GitLab, and I said, you know, explore the source. The point of this is basically to have some idea of where to look in the source if you're trying to figure out how I did something. Um, you might not need jQuery.com, uh, and then those those Drupal uh, docs for developing for Drupal APIs and creating modules. They're useful. I am sure I'm at or over time. Any questions? When is your session tomorrow? Ten fifteen, and that's going to talk about accessibility and different kinds of checkers. And, using this. Yeah, using why why this is different from other things and where it. What it does and doesn't do, and why you might be interested. In. Yeah, it actually talks about the module. So. Okay. Thank you for creating this. Yeah, it's a great Thank you. Well done.